So we'll go ahead and start with our motivation prayer. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the pratamoksha, bodhisattva, and tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience, not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration, through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence but still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by our merits from giving and other perfections. May we become Buddhas to benefit all sentient beings. And reviving the fact that a perfection or paramita our aspirations and activities directed toward achieving Buddhahood. Someone with uncontrived bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva. And so far we've done generosity, the intention to give, ethics, restraint from harming, patience, forbearance with suffering, joyous effort, enthusiasm for beneficial actions, and last week we started on concentration, abiding with a beneficial object. And next week we'll go into wisdom, realization of ultimate reality. So before we get into it, just really think to yourself, even though it might seem obvious, why do we need concentration? Why do we need concentration? And how is it developed? These are so obvious, so self-evident, and yet somehow we live a life that goes against developing concentration. So we need to remind ourselves, why do we need it? What happens without it? 
both in daily life and on the spiritual path, in terms of habits. Does anyone feel comfortable sharing? Just really obvious, simple, quick, you know, why do we need concentration, just generally speaking? Well, without concentration, my mind is one long Amazon shopping list. You know, <laughs> it just, it go, it's constantly on something and I'm not a worrier and I'm not ruminating about stuff, but it's always on something that if it weren't on that, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. I'm, I'm chasing after things that are totally unimportant 100%. Yep. Yeah, that is a very good point. In the absence of somehow disciplined concentration, you will still find something to focus on. It's not like your mind is ever without a focus, but it's just going to run through different potential things that might stimulate temporary happiness. So it's right. going to focus here and there and here and there, just kind of jumping around, as you said, like an Amazon shopping list. Happiness, happiness, happiness. <laughs> and it's, it's a toddler. You know, if you yeah. let it run, it'll run. Absolutely. And it'll get into all sorts of trouble. And <laughs> um, yeah. And there's a, there was a question that came to me privately in the chat. Is concentration and mindfulness in this context? Um, Concentration and mindfulness are not necessarily synonymous, but they're obviously related. So we're gonna jump into that soon. And it's a really good point to, to sit with. Right now we're kind of going into concentration in general and then the perfection of concentration specifically. And concentration in general, we understand, you know, Buddhist or not, we know we need to be able to focus attentively for anything we do to have power and continuity, that without sustained attention, what we get done is very here and there, very kind of hit and miss, and a distracted mind has far more opportunities for mistakes. So, you know, whether what, whatever direction makes you feel like it's important, whether it's the benefits of having concentration or the disadvantages of when you don't, we need to kind of remind ourselves that in the absence of concentration, our best intentions lack power. Our best work lacks power. It lacks sustainability. It lacks, lacks continuity. So discipline isn't about being a good person. Discipline is about being an effective person. Yeah. And so we bring discipline to concentration, not because we should, but because it's useful that way. And so you're framing it more in logical terms rather than moralistic terms. Because the more heavy you make it, the more you'll have an internal rebellion, trying to squeeze yourself into it, finding yourself lacking, getting discouraged and chucking it out. So if you make it a whole moralistic good and bad conversation, it's not gonna be useful. Frame it in terms of logic. And I, I say this all the time, and I say it all the time because it's so important, which is for us kind, good people, our mistakes are usually done because we're distracted. Not because we're bad, not because we want to, not because we're plotting the demise of humanity, because we're distracted. And if we weren't distracted, we wouldn't hurt people. We wouldn't hurt ourselves. We wouldn't make the same unfortunate choices. So it's the distracted mind that leaves open the opportunity for all these mistakes. And so if that can help kind of motivate you that actually, if I want to live by these ideals, I need to be focused. Yeah, and that's worth really taking a minute and asking myself, what stands in the way of my focus? And in daily life, what do I allow to grab my focus and take it here and there and indulge in kind of sensory enjoyments as opposed to zeroing in on the deep stuff and then consciously shifting to sensory enjoyments for nourishment, for rest, for, you know, acknowledged distraction rather than our default setting just being the mind going all over the shop. And then it's so difficult to kind of rein it in to look at one thing. But if you're already in the habit of looking at one thing at a time, 
it's not so difficult to, to deepen that. But sometimes when we're trying to meditate, for example, single pointedly, half the battle is just getting yourself to settle down. Yeah. And then once you do settle down, you realize how tired you are and you just want to go to sleep. And so you never hit the sweet spot in between very focused and very relaxed. You just kind of go from hyper to crash. And that is so normal. And it has existed from beginningless time. And you are not bad or weird or strange if that is you. That should be such good news. So sometimes people feel like, oh, the world's getting more distracted or people are getting more, you know, kind of hyper or more stimulated. We're just finding different things to be stimulated by. I was thinking about how um, my, I have a family member who has ADHD and when she has a conversation and she's got some, you know, neurodiversity things as well. So which is which is hard to know. But when she has a one-on-one conversation, it's hard for her to just look at you. Yeah, it's a little bit too confronting. It's a little too intimate. It's too intense. And years ago, she used to do the crossword puzzle while having a conversation. And it used to drive all of the family crazy and be like, just look at me. Why, why do you need to do the crossword puzzle? And, and we realized that her having divided focus made her more focused. And now she has an iPad and she plays Candy Crush while she talks to people. So you might think, oh, it's the tablet's fault. It's the Candy Crush. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the iPad. No. Before she had the iPad, it was just the crossword puzzle. It was just something else. You know, and this is an example of how we're going to find ways to split our focus, whether there's technology or not. But the other lesson here is we're all really different. And what creates a sustained attention is going to be really different. So for some people, single pointedness helps first. For other people, analysis and elaboration helps first. For some people, visualization helps first. So it's not about saying I should only do this kind of meditation. And if I can't, I'm bad. We're really wired different ways because of habituation and past lives. And so if you're finding that in order for you to focus, you need to be moving, that's not a fault. Do walking meditation. You know, if you find that for you to focus, it helps you to hold on to something tactile, well, mantras are good and use prayer beads and anchor yourself that way. So rather than going against type, kind of sit with what are the elements in my life when I am focused in a worldly sense? And how can I use that information to frame how I might focus in a Dharma sense? You know? Some people have to take notes during class. Some people taking notes during class makes them too distracted. You know, it's like taking notes or not taking notes is not good or bad per se. What facilitates your integration of material and your connection with content? So let it be really personal and don't feel like you have to be defensive or uh, apologetic or anything about your style of moving into heightened concentration know yourself and then bring it to a Dharma context. So that's what I really wanna encourage us to keep coming back to. Don't go against type. Don't go against the, the wave of habits. Use your wave of habits, but in a slightly tweaked, slightly dar- more Dharmic, slightly deeper way. All right, so how is it developed is probably straightforward. The, um, <laughs> the hint is spoiler alert meditation, but of course it can be developed in many other ways as well. So why do we need concentration for anything and everything to have more stability and power? Then from a Buddhist perspective, we need it in order to conjoin it with the wisdom realizing emptiness in order to cut the root of samsara and to then go on to achieve Buddhahood full enlightenment. So if we have amazing good heart, amazing study, all sorts of knowledge, all sorts of merit and abilities, but no concentration, we're never gonna be able to cut the root of samsara and then go on to these incredibly high realizations, which will be able to help us benefit sentient beings more directly. 
So concentration is very vital. And it's developed through familiarization. Familiarization with a focal object. And there are countless focal objects you could pick. And when I say focal, I don't mean visual. I mean, you know, objects you bring to mind. So repetition is what's going to build focus. And that's very simple. That's very logical and straightforward. So that's good news. You have this amazing skill you want, develop it through familiarization. So through familiarization, i.e. meditation, many types. So in general, we talk about analytical meditation, which is also known as vipassana. And this leads to special insight, which is a deeper realization than just an understanding. Then we have single pointed meditation, which is also called shamatha. And in Tibetan, you'll hear it called shine. And this leads to calm abiding, which is perfect single pointed concentration. So right now we can be single pointed for a few seconds, but once we have calm abiding, we're gonna be able to hold our attention on one thing for more than four hours without any tightness or tension or stress. In fact, it's actually going to be beautiful and blissful. And then we also have visualization. And visualization is used mostly in Tantra, but in some other contexts as well. And in some traditions, Vipassana has elements of shamatha and shamatha has elements of Vipassana and the distinction is not so clearly defined. But in Tibetan Buddhism, we very much do define analytical is going through a structure with conscious reflective thought. And single pointed meditation is settling the mind on one virtuous object. So they're quite distinct in our tradition, even though in one session, you might alternate between the two tools or skills. I think most of you are pretty much, this is familiar content, right? How to divide meditation in general. But when you're looking at that once again, are there questions that you've had over the years about these categories that you've always been meaning to ask or anything coming up right now? Analytical meditation, single pointed meditation. If you wanted to, could you do it by yourself? Yeah, Tenzin, go ahead. Um, I've always had um, some amount of difficulty understanding analytical meditation. Yeah. Um, specifically, when uh, when you, when your mind's calmed down, and when you're analyzing your subject, um, aren't we using our thoughts? Yep. And uh, and so so my confusion is if we're using thoughts, and um, yeah, I just don't know why we're using thoughts. Because well, uh, <laughs> what you, what's your goal? What's your goal? To develop insight. Yep. And is insight something that you could achieve without concepts first, do you think? No. You, right. You would need concept for an insight. To, it's, to it's tricky because probably you hear a lot, we're trying to develop perception, like direct perception. Why would you use conception or thoughts to get to perception, direct experience? But the way the mind works is that it actually takes a great deal of conception to get to perception. And so this is kind of like a seven types of awareness, uh, Lorig conversation, or a minds and mental factors, Sem Semchung conversation. But the basic idea is that through familiarization with one concept, when it's a virtuous concept, you can move it from an understanding to a realization and they're not the same thing. And the way to do that is through hearing, reflection and meditation. So first you hear, you study it, you've heard the concept from someone else and you remember what the someone else said or what the someone else wrote. And then when you reflect on it, you're trying to understand, do I agree with that or not? What would that look like for me? How would that work in daily life? And you're taking an intellectual understanding and making it more personal and really seeing, is this something I'm on board with? 
And through that wisdom of reflection, then you come to a conclusion, which is what I heard resonates with what I experience. And what I've heard resonates with where I want to be and the processes make sense how I would get there. Therefore, I'm gonna take what I've understood and believed in and meditate on it, meaning repeat, repeat, repeat. So take something really basic like compassion. Someone explains to you, compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. And then you sit with it in reflection and you go, what does that mean, the wish? Oh, like an aspiration, a want, a yearning to free all sentient beings, free, free. That means liberation, nirvana, end of suffering. Okay, is that possible? Four noble truths, mm -hmm. probably. Sentient beings, being with mind. From what? Suffering. Okay, that is physical, that is mental. All right, so I'm looking at freedom, I'm looking at suffering, I'm looking at sentient beings, I'm looking at an aspiration for that. Am I on board? Yes, I am. <laughs> Yes. And then you meditate on it. So this reflection stage can almost be an analytical meditation, but it's a little bit more loose where you can let your mind play with one concept's interaction with other concepts. For example, oh, if I had more patience, it would be easier to develop my compassion. Or compassion has this relationship with loving kindness. Or and you can kind of explore the connections and interactions with other topics, but basically you're studying, you're mulling it over and you come to the conclusion, I want more compassion. And that conclusion gives you enough energy to sit with it. And then when you sit with it, you go more experientially. So to meditate on compassion analytically, you would start with defining it in words, and then defining it in experience, right? So you'd say the words, compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. I've thought about that. I know what that means. What does it feel like to receive it? What does it feel like to give it? What is it like? And you really identify it. And then you pivot to what are the disadvantages of when I don't have compassion? What are the disadvantages of when the world doesn't have compassion? When my relationships don't have compassion? When my choices don't have compassion, et cetera, et cetera? What happens without compassion? And when you're sitting with it, you already know it's no good when there's no compassion. You're not trying to prove that. You've already proved that. You know, life is no good without compassion. But what you're doing is you're trying to hit these points of resonance where you really think what you know, you now know like the penny dropped, it's got the ring of truth. Yeah, it's moved from your head to your heart. And you remember times when compassion changed everything. Yeah, or when compassion supported such good things or it healed such bad things or it got you through this or it helped with that. You can use history when amazing policies of some sort of, you know, uh, different, continents, different communities, different countries coming together and working towards something good and how amazing those pockets of time in history were and how in the absence of that, the world goes to hell and there's all the war and yada, 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 right? Disadvantages. Then you go to what are the advantages of when there is compassion, personally, globally, socially, etc. Again, you already believe it's a good idea, but you're walking yourself through specific reasons why in such a way that it touches you. And through just those simple two pivots, disadvantages without, advantages with, you come to the conclusion of, this is the priority of my life. And you hit it so deeply. And then you stay with that, knowing as single pointedly as you can. And that's how you then can move from a single point of an analytical meditation on a concept to a single pointed meditation on a concept. But by doing that again and again, you become so familiarized with the concept of compassion that it'll move from single pointed resonance to actual perception, actual integration. 
And take the example of something like Bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, when that moves from head to heart to direct experience, that's when you've achieved the Mahayana path of accumulation, meaning that you're at an actual Bodhisattva. So when that deep knowing turns into an integration that you cannot forget, that imbues every other thought, that's a realization. Yeah. So for us, we have moments of touching it, of resonating with it, of feeling it, but it's not become so thoroughly habituated that it colors every other thought. But it will. It will just with practice. And it'll get stronger and stronger. So you really have to engage your conceptual thoughts deeply to get to a non-conceptual, perceptual, direct space with it. And some... I guess, Buddhism light, watered down, kind of not really Buddhism, Buddhism, kind of jumps steps and says, just be compassion, go. And you're like, oh, okay, go. <laughs> be compassion, you know. And if you're really, really habituated with compassion, you might actually touch something just like that. But for most of us, it's going to be forced or it's going to be fake. Yeah. And then you're gonna feel like a hypocrite or you're gonna feel grumpy that the process doesn't work or whatever things can happen or you'll gaslight yourself and pretend it's happening when it's not really and become unbearable to be around. Many disasters can happen. So use your intelligence, but use it with precision and with discipline, which is why there's such an emphasis on study in the Gaelic tradition. Because if you study well, the meditation comes very easy. Yeah, because you've sorted out a lot of the things you need to clarify and a lot of your doubts before you even get to the cushion. And then when you get to the cushion, you start finding the big existential doubts about a certain concept, and you can have really clear, big, deep questions to bring a teacher, rather than what is compassion. It's like, well, look it up, study it, remember it, you know, you can do that by yourself. <laughs> but for the big teacher, you might want to save some meaty questions that can't be found in books or are hard to find in books. Do you know, just as we kind of mature as Dharma students, of course, in the beginning, ask beginning questions and ask beginning questions for 20 years, if you want to, that's okay. But if you want to make the most out of one-on-one -on -one interactions with teachers, study <laughs> you know study because if you study well then you're going to have deeper questions so this whole question of how do we use conception will keep coming up but the summary of all of this is to say there is no escaping thinking deeply <laughs> right if you want to progress on the spiritual path you're going to have to think deeply and personally about these things we are not a passive religion <laughs> we are not passive yeah, other, other thoughts about analytical meditation? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. I wanted to share something, because um, where I am at the moment is a, a place of great suffering, and I hear it, I hear it, you know, loudly. And recently I, I, I will flip around in my wheelchair, and um, this one particular woman in particular who really screams and and. They've taken the bell away so that she's not ringing it all the time. Mm -hmm. But I went in to her, and this is not this is not about me. I'm I'm sharing because I feel it's meditation in action, mm -hmm. and I'm going into her and just being there with her, and just talking to her, and asking her permission gently if she wanted her feet massaged. And as you know, I only have one hand at the moment, so. I was just, just massaging her for, and the whole change in that person, you know, like the screaming stopped, <clears throat> the, um, the sharing of her family, all sorts of different things happened. So it's very difficult to get a peaceful moment here, yeah. you know, so I'm thinking, and sometimes my meditation is a bit distorted, but yeah. I was thinking that, um, having doing 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 this was a meditation you know That's like it, it, it was like compassion it was really deep compassion for the suffering of 
this particular woman, which is many, and there are several that I go and talk to and and alleviate some of that suffering for them, I think. You mm -hmm. know, so I was just think my question, I guess, was around med meditation and action. Yeah. You know, like it's, yeah, you know, I've often wondered what realization is. You know, how do you know you've got realization? How do you know? You know, what is there, what is it about something? You know, how how do you know that you have this realization is really my question. Yeah. You know, so yeah. When it doesn't leave, when you don't have to yeah. manufacture it, when you don't have to stop and think for it to be there, when it's just it's, your default. Yeah. Right, right. But yeah. you might have had what's called a correct assumption far before that which is you deeply know it you deeply believe it and you do live by it quite often but mm. you might also forget and you know you have your stressed moments and your whatever moments and it's you know patchy but it's when it's there it's really there because you really mm. do believe it it's just not strong enough to pervade every moment of every day but it will with repetition yeah 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 and, and the difference between meditation and action is really just the activity. The mind can be quite similar and gets more and more similar as time goes by. The meditation is like your launch sequence to prepare you for when you're off the cushion. Yeah. So when you're mm. off the cushion, you behave just as you describe, which is this woman is in terrible distress. Maybe just one simple kindness will help a little. And you just, you know, and you're not necessarily even planning it or structuring it in your mind. You're just acting because that's the mm. natural, quote, human thing to do in that moment. But it's only the natural human thing to do in that moment because of how much habituation you have to compassion from the past. Mm. Because it wouldn't be the natural human thing for everyone to do. Lots of people are just annoyed or they feel bad and helpless, or, you know, million reactions. But, you know, you just kind of like, yep, this is something I can do with my one good hand. Hopefully your other hand gets better soon, but I'm guessing it'll be a while. <laughs> but I'm guessing too, that in, in helping relieve just that immediate suffering of isolation, of disconnection, yeah. of lack of mm -hmm. human connection for her, you probably feel better about your own pain as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It always works. It works, even though that wasn't yeah. your intention. Yeah. That's the side effect. No. Yeah. 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 So more of that. <laughs> Proceed, right? And it's a lucky nursing home that you're in. They're going to be sad when you leave. <laughs> you're not going to be sad when you leave, but they're going to be no, sad. No, 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 no. <laughs> But I, I guess this is the thing, too, is that all of the stories you hear about great meditators going away to a cave, it's not to go mm. away to a cave forever. It's to go away to a cave to develop and deepen their strength so that when they come out of the cave, their skills are more precise and more deep and can more deeply help sentient beings. Mm. So it's a little bit like this analogy I hear a lot of, um, if you know someone has brain cancer and you hold their hand, that is very kind, but you can let go of their hand, go away and learn the cure for brain cancer and how to do accurate surgeries for it. And they may die and many people may die, but once you're done with your study, you're gonna be able to uproot the cause of suffering rather than just soothe them during their mm -hmm. suffering. Mm -hmm. And both are needed and we need people working on all levels. And it's not like a hierarchy or even a necessarily judgment of better or worse. It's just knowing what your own capability is. And if you choose to be the hand holder when you could actually be the surgeon, it's a misuse of your energy. But if you know you only have the energy and capability to be a hand holder, that is beautiful, good practice. Don't look down on it. So it's very personal, very individual, and it changes day to day because the people around you sometimes need your deepest, best work. And sometimes the people around you can't really receive your deepest, best work. 
and they need someone to just look after their basic needs and feed them and be kind to them and smile at them. And maybe you can do that, but maybe if you withdraw and gather deeper strength, that's gonna actually be of greater long-term benefit. So it depends, right? And this is why it's so tricky with something like compassion, because we just want to relieve suffering. But are we just making samsara more comfortable for people? Or are we actually getting them out? Sometimes making samsara more comfortable is a good, kind thing to do. And we should. And sometimes it's a form of laziness. And only we know that, we and the Buddhas. Um, so I was listening to Eleanor describe her experience and um i had an experience this week as well that i will not get into but a woman poured out a horrible tragedy involving her child and it was i was not prepared <laughs> so um in my life i've had a tendency of attracting this kind of conversation just because i am able to listen <laughs> and um one thing I did practice immediately was a bit of what I've learned about Tong Len. Mm. And um, I did find it a, a weird mix of concentration, but also uh, because of the things she was sharing, my analytical part of me was ready to form, like I'm forming the story, you know, yeah. but um, I also sensed deeply through the conversation when my own shift happened, where I was able to actually receive her pain because um, I could see the change in her. And it was a shift in just her open, it's almost as like her entire self just opened up. It was, mm -hmm. and normally I do a lot of, <laughs> normally in my life I have a lot of personal little barriers to that um, only because I'm a very anxious person and can be easily excited. Um, but in this case, this practice helped me. And I was just wondering if that's something that Eleanor knew as well, because she just seemed to have such a natural way um, of knowing that touch was very important for this person. And um, yeah, I, I'm just now becoming a little more clear about the differences between more analytical meditation and then focusing um, on a fixed, you know, object yeah. or representation of something. So yeah, and Tonglen is kind of uh, one of those hybrid practices with a little, some elements. I was wondering if it was related. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, knowing Eleanor as I do, she is a Tonglen aficionado, so don't worry, she knows. <laughs> she knows all. <laughs> um, so to speak for you, Eleanor, sorry, <laughs> that you know about Tonglen very well. And um, this giving and taking practice is such a mental gymnastics because you want the attitude I will take your suffering while knowing you can't. <laughs> yes, except in a few very rare cases of strong karmic connection, that is such a side note footnote that it almost never comes up, but there is a case in which that's nearly the case, see the fine print, but you're adopting this attitude of, I 100% want to take your suffering and you're not, rem you're not remembering on purpose that you can't. <laughs> What you're thinking is, I want to take all of this suffering and give it where? Give it to what started suffering. Suffering was started from self-cherishing and self-grasping. So that's where I give the suffering back to. Not to my good, kind heart, not to myself, not to my sense of well-being, but to that one to blame for everything. That one to blame for everything is where I give the suffering to. And then I imagine I give all of my happiness, merit, well-being, even though you know you can't because karma is not transferable. Yes, but you adopt the attitude as if that's the case. And what happens when you're doing Tong Len is that you become such a powerful condition for the person in front of you that their suffering may be allevi alleviated. So if they've created the karmic seed to be relieved of suffering, you can be the condition that facilitates that. So it becomes as if you took their suffering, but you couldn't literally take it. You were a condition for theirs to release. It's a little bit like, I don't know if any of you have chronic pain, but if you take the same painkiller for a long time, it stops working, but it's the same painkiller. It's like kind of you ran out of the merit for it to work. Yeah, or the same 
exact pills work differently on different people. So the point of that is these pills are a condition for pain relief, but they only work if the person has the cause for pain to be relieved by that. Yeah, but pain can be relieved by that. So take the Tylenol for goodness sake, take it. But if it doesn't work, it's not because the Tylenol is faulty. It's because you yourself haven't created the cause for it to work. So in this case with Tonglen, in your example, Charity, you were like the Tylenol. And that person had the ability to be soothed by that. And so you did have a direct impact. You were a strong condition, even though you weren't the cause. And it's such a beautiful way to practice compassion and action while developing concentration that Tonglen, I think, should be all of our heart practice if we can work up to it at least. Um, quickly, you said, when you're um, receiving the Tonglen, that you be the you be the person, um, the one person that alone. What what can you expand upon that? Because that kind of you kind of lost me there. The one person that would be receiving all of the the negative, um, mm -hmm. like the one person that was responsible for. So I wasn't sure. I wasn't. I'm following. saying what, what's responsible for suffering is self cherishing. That's the one to blame for everything. Ah, uh, okay. And it's, okay. it's referencing a mind training slogan that's one of my favorites yeah. from Seven Point Mind Training of Geshe Chikawa, which is banish the one to blame for everything. But the one to blame for everything is self-cherishing and self-grasping. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you for clarification. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked. So it's like their self-cherishing and their self-grasping is why they are suffering. But you're thinking... I also have self-cherishing and self-grasping, and that is why I have suffering. So actually, they're helping me by me taking their suffering and giving it to my self-cherishing thought. And it's all of this is just a mental attitude that helps you not have resistance to being next to pain, your own or anyone else's. Because what normally happens, and you know, Charity was saying like she attracts people with similar kind of stories. And I think we all have kind of a karmic affinity where if a stranger is gonna talk to us, it's probably gonna be a similar topic. Like I have a friend who works in palliative care and people with dying relatives find her. I don't know how they find her, but we can just be in an elevator and someone starts talking about their dying relative. Right, people, if I'm walking around in a city, people with chemical dependency issues will find me. I don't know how they find me, but they find me. Yes, so we all have our like, whatever magnetism. And, and I think that if we kind of use that, it can really be a, quite a deep, beautiful practice. But normally what happens is we're like, oh no, not again. Oh, not again, not you again, oh no. And with Tonglen, you overcome your resistance. So you're not suffering in response to their suffering. And if you're not suffering in response to their suffering, you're not adding pressure to their pain. Yeah, you don't, you're not feeling like someone who is fixing them because it's annoying to be around a suffering person and now they feel ashamed for suffering. You're able to just hold the space for as long as they're going through it. Because you've gotten your, your ego and your self-cherishing and all your stuff just out of the picture. You can just hold the space by even thinking voluntarily, I want this to be happening. Because all of this suffering experience is building resiliency and opening my heart. So thank you, random stranger, for approaching me and telling me about Wada Wada, right? It's interesting, but it changes the whole dynamic if you start with not having resistance. So Tongwen works on so many levels and it is one of those hybrid practices with a bit of, um, bit of visualization, bit of single pointedness, bit of analysis, and you just kind of gently weave in layers to it. And uh, ultimately it's just a mentality that is hugely effective for working with pain of all types. So analytical meditation, single pointed meditation, visualization, these are kind of things that we're gonna keep working on our abilities for. In the perfection of concentration, we're talking specifically about single pointedness. Single pointedness as its own specific separate skill. And when you develop that as its own specific separate skill, eventually you can bring your powers of analysis to it and combine them in such a way that your analytical mind doesn't disrupt your single pointed mind. But right now for us, it would. 
which is why we do analysis over here, single pointedness over here, some meditations that alternate between them, but we can't really merge them. Although in Tantra, we attempt to, and sometimes that can be effective if you have that affinity and merit. But really when you're developing single pointedness, you're, you're, you're working to battle against the temptations of the five senses to distract you, which means you're gonna need certain preliminaries before it's even possible. So if you're feeling like single pointed concentration just isn't coming anytime soon, again, don't force it. Take a few step backs and ask yourself, do I have the prerequisites? Do I have the right foundation for this to even be possible? Because if not, don't hit your head against the wall. Work on your analytical side because that's gonna greatly improve your daily life. And then gradually work on those preliminaries so that you can have that single pointed concentration. Perfection of concentration is about single pointedness and that's gonna take a little while. But the combination of single pointedness and analytical is what's gonna cut the root of samsara when it's directed with special insight, wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah, so when you have your analytical meditation on emptiness, very clear and precise. And when you have your single pointed abilities, very stable and clear, you combine them. And that eventually leads to cutting the root of samsara. So for single pointed concentration, we use a positive mental object. If it's visual, it needs to be bright and heavy. You see it visually first, then you bring it to your mind's eye and stabilize. So this is what we did last week. Um, how did it go when we did this last week? Just using a mentally generated image. Could you, could you look at the Buddha, close your eyes, bring it to your mind's eye and hold your attention on it? Or was it just super hard? Or what happened last week when we tried that? Even just for a couple minutes. Yeah, uh, Charity. So I was not able to attend, but I watched the video. and. Um, I think my problem is, you know, I have religious figures in my mind from my past. Mm. So different religious figures will float through my mind when I try to do this single pointed thing until it's just some kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. brightly beaming handy thing. So uh, that was my problem. <laughs> you have a, a bodhisattva saint battle happening or, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's quite common. Um, and it's a little, but strangely, it's not as different to your analytical distractions as it might seem. For example, if you try to meditate on compassion, some of your distractions will be other good topics. And you wouldn't think of them as distractions because they're good things like patience or love or whatever. And your mind will say, oh, well, that's a good idea. I'll focus on that. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll focus on that. And the discipline, whether it's single pointed or analytical, is to go, hmm, I seem distracted by blah, 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 coming back. So you're not forcing it away. You're not pushing it away. You're turning towards it and going, huh, okay, St. Francis of Assisi, I see you. Well done. Anyway, Buddha. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, right? Oh, it's St. Teresa. Yeah. Good work there. Anyway, back to Buddha. Or it could be that you have such a strong affinity with a bodhisattva of a different tradition that you choose that instead. And if it's virtuous and it represents compassion and wisdom, it's good. So if you prefer St. Teresa, use St. Teresa. There's no holy image or holy figure competition. They're all in cahoots. Choose who you like. Yeah. And if any kind of religious iconography is just way too loaded for you, it's just too much, you could use a heart, <laughs> you could use a flower, you could use the moon, but choose something that has a positive connotation rather than a completely neutral one. The reason for that being, as I mentioned last week, is as you develop familiarity with the object, you're also developing merit by seeing it and thinking well of it. So you're building these positive associations, even while you're also developing single pointedness. So it's just more efficient if you choose a positive mental object, but what you choose can be totally up to you. 
the thing that you shouldn't choose that some traditions do choose, not Buddhist traditions, is an attachment object. So say your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your non-binary friend, you bring them to your mind's eye because you like the look of them. And you're like, you are cute. I can look at you all day. You can develop a lot of concentration that way, but it's not helpful. <laughs> so don't choose an attachment object. Yeah. Um, Janine, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I think it's very related to what you were just saying, but I, I noticed because I have many, you know, deities, uh, you know, images on my altar, similar to you behind you, um, that, you know, I might start thinking about, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha, but then some other, you know, deity yeah. will, will kind of replace it. So it's, it's, it's the same idea, but yes. you know, it's, it's kind of my mind kind of going to different virtuous objects. Yeah, and, and your surface reasoning will be, what's the best one? But the deeper truth of it is your mind will always find a reason to be distracted. So it's like, don't believe the surface reason. There, you know, Chen Rezig is the same as Shakyamuni, is the same as Prajnaparamita. They're all Buddhas, it's fine. Just pick one and land on it and stay with it. And don't let yourself rebel against it because your distraction will always find a reason to say, not this, this, not this, this. And that's been the problem from beginningless time. So when you're finding your object of single pointedness, really spend some time finding something that your mind likes to look at. You know, so we never judge different images of the Buddhas as, the, as Buddhas. We think they're all equal, but we can judge the artist's rendering. <laughs> the artist's rendering may be less or more skillful. So find an artist's rendering of the image that makes your mind happy. You know, someone that's balanced, one that has a nice smiley face, one that's not doing something weird, no smudges, you know, and the deities are always perfect, but the artists are human. So sometimes they make images that will annoy you if you keep looking at them. So choose an artist rendering you like. The other piece is if a visualized image doesn't work for you at all because you have the word I cannot pronounce, aphatasia, aphatasia, you know, you know what I'm talking about? This like there's a small percentage of the population that can't visualize. Like you say, think of a purple apple and they can't. They're like, yeah, apples, yeah, purple, but I can't see it in my mind's eye. I just can't. There's a certain percentage they just can't. Don't worry about it. There are other things to meditate on. Um, yeah, Tenzin, go ahead. So when I was doing the visualization practice, um, what, 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 what kept happening was uh, things were getting blurry and mm. like someone was reducing the opacity, Yeah, you know? Uh, like I was visualizing Shakyamuni Buddhas, uh, there's a poster that's super um, um, familiar to me, uh, but I was only able to visualize certain aspects at one time, not the whole, you know, picture, yeah. the image. So, and it was like fading in and out. Yep. That's usually what happens when I try to yep. visualize. And sometimes it'll like drift over to the right or drift over to the left, or it'll like yeah. shrink or it'll get bigger mm -hmm. or like it doesn't hold still. This is mm -hmm. really common. And I'm glad mm -hmm. you brought it up. It's really common. And what you do in this case is try not to put too much pressure on yourself to keep detail, but also don't let yourself off the hook into just total random light blur. So if you were to think of something very, very, very familiar, like the dashboard of your car, you could see it in your mind's eye right now with a great amount of detail if you'd had that same car for five or six years. Yeah, where that little knobby is and this little knobby is and that, it, you know, you know what the dashboard of your car looks like. And that's a lot of detail. Yeah, or if you think of the face of your best friend or you think of the details of your favorite Renaissance painter, there's a huge amount of detail you can bring to your mind's eye when you have no pressure and when it's really familiar. So these Buddha images are very familiar to a lot of us. And then you try and close your eyes and bring it to your mind's eye and you can't. And it's like, what? I know what Buddha looks like, come on. And you're like, which hand is down? Left one, right one. 
which one is in his lap? Left one, right one. And you know, you go sort of visualization dyslexic and all sorts of things happen. And in this case, all you're trying to do is just keep your intention, which was in the beginning, this size, shape, color at this distance in front of you, I'm bringing my intention back to that. And whether it appears clearly or not, I'm not gonna even worry about it. Because some days I have mental haze of various types and some days I don't, I'm just gonna keep coming back to front center, that size, shape, color, that image I've seen, and just keep coming back. And when it floats, I just consciously bring it back. And when it leaves, you keep bringing your intention there and you're really not worried about what actually appears. You're not worried about what actually appears. You keep coming back to your initial intention. So it's very much like analytical, right? You think I'm staying with compassion. Oh, but patience. And you're like, I see you patience. I'll come back to you. Compassion, yeah? Or, oh, laundry list. Yes, I see you laundry list. Anyway, compassion. So it's just the same discipline. Acknowledge the distractions, acknowledge when it's not clear, but don't acknowledge it too long or make a story about it or worry. Just notice, disengage, come back. Yeah, and that's the discipline and do it for short sessions. Yeah, short sessions where you don't burn out your abilities. Yeah, Roxy, go ahead. It, it's helpful to hear all of this in the, con con um, the context of just sh uh, developing shamatha as opposed to maybe doing a chin resig practice or something where it feels almost like it might, for me anyway, feel a little sacrilegious to get it wrong. Mm. Is he holding the Vajra? Is he holding the Lotus in this hand, that hand? And I think, oh, I'm messing up symbolism that means something really mm. um, real. And, and yet when I, what you're saying though, I, I like Shamatha. Vipassana. I like shamatha. <laughs> I like being able to focus on one thing because my mind tends to cap capture too much. And then I get a little judgmental about whether or not the imagery is um, that I'm just making it up. So if we say to ourselves, I'm just doing single pointed, do you feel like that can kind of let you off the hook if you don't quite get the imagery right? I know I heard, I hear you saying that. So it, oh. it's, it's other, about, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's about staying with your intention for it to be clear, even if it's never clear. And it's keeping your intention for it to be accurate, even if it's never accurate. And the thing that'll happen is that when your mind relaxes, but doesn't lose clarity, there'll be a couple magic sessions where suddenly it's just like bright, vivid, clear in perfect detail, bing, just there in front of you and you think where were you my whole life I've been trying this for ages and you know but it's like your mind got relaxed enough while holding clarity that then you could actually clearly have to stay with it but that's not even the main point the main point is keeping that discipline that returns and returns and returns to what you chose to do from the outset and that, that ties in perfectly with what we talked about with joyous effort, which is it kills your momentum and it kills your joy if you give up halfway through something. So you just keep that like, come what may, I'm gonna just keep at it gently, no pressure, no expectations. Yeah, and then you bring that same idea to your sadhanas and think, Chen Rezig will be holding what he's holding or he won't be, but I know what he's supposed to be holding. So let's just imagine that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just gently, gently. Yeah, Christina, go ahead. Um, I'm curious when you're doing the like the the concentration meditation. Let's say we're visualizing a Chen Rezig, if or Tara, whoever, whomever. If you're saying the mantra at the same time that you're visualizing it, is that then not technically? concentration because then I'm 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 using a different it's like it's like I'm almost like I don't know if that's cheating or if that's not actually accurate so I'm curious about that and because I know sometimes I've been in retreats where we're saying the mantra and then afterwards it was like we could just sit and concentrate like the teacher was like okay now now just concentrate on the feeling that's left with like within your body that that feeling that emanates from the mantra and that so was like something that i could just focus on right and it was like but that's like focusing on a feeling versus like visual like visually speaking 
um, like I can get in my mind and get distracted. So sometimes I'll just say the mantra while I'm visualizing. And I don't know if that's incorrect or that's wrong. What, what is correct is to do what you set out to do. So mm -hmm. if you set out to do your tantric practice, the special feature of Tantra is that it combines calm abiding and special insight within the practice. It combines them from the outset. And that's a unique feature of Tantra is that it brings in analysis and single pointedness simultaneously from the very beginning. So visualizing the deity while saying the mantra is completely fine and good and proceed. But if you set out to do single pointedness and you were gonna visualize Tara, and then you couldn't hold Tara, so you added the mantra, because maybe that'll help, then it's wrong. So if you set out to do Tantra, it's good. If you set out to do single pointedness, it's wrong. So it's basically follow through with what you cho chose to do. Late, you know, as you get down the, the path and maybe you have lots of empowerments, it's tricky because you're doing a blue one, then you're doing a green one, then you're doing a white one. And it's just keeping the discipline of right now, just this and then consciously shifting gears, and now just this. And they will try and interject and replace each other. And you just say, I see you distraction. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Cause that is that, that tricky thing about Tantra is that it, it combines them from the outset and that's why it's quicker and that's why it's harder. <laughs> a positive mental object, Use a visualized image if you can. If you can't, don't stress about it. You can use the breath. You can use the mind itself. You can use a concept that you know so well analytically that you can drop into it quite quickly. So if you were to do single pointed meditation on compassion, you would do the analysis very briefly, just enough to kind of like resonate and be in it and then hold your attention there without analysis. And then if it kind of fades and you're not feeling it anymore, you can spark it up with a brief analysis and then stay there. If you're using the mind itself, then the preliminary is kind of let yourself watch your thoughts without chasing them, without suppressing them. That classic meditation that we've done many times of just, you know, <laughs> watching the clouds, being aware of the sky, not identifying with the weather, lovely, lovely. You can do this in a way where it becomes a single pointed meditation where you've watched your thoughts or you've watched the clouds enough that you can see the blue without being distracted by the clouds. Or you can be with the mind reflective, expansive, spacious, without being distracted by the mental activity kind of within it or under it. So you'll still have a thought in words or you'll have a random sound or a memory or a song will still blip into your focus, but you're really not bringing any focus to that at all. You're staying with the mind itself. So to stay with the mind itself, you have to have found the mind itself. And to find the mind itself, that primary mental consciousness is hard because there's a whole lot of mental factors vying for attention, very, very chatty, saying, pick me. <laughs> and you're like, I see you, but no, under, under, under. Yeah, just to get to the spacious clarity. So for some people, that's very natural and they go there very easily and it's lovely. And for some people, they're second guessing it for so much of the meditation, it's not the best focal object for single pointedness for them. So personal choice. The breath is good if you don't have anxiety. <laughs> Sometimes people with anxiety are encouraged to focus on the breath in order to settle their anxiety. And sometimes that works and sometimes it makes it worse. Yes, because for a lot of people, their panic lives in their breath and by focusing there, it can actually activate it and escalate it. So if that's you, don't worry, don't use the breath or shift the breath to the lower part of the breath down in the stomach and focus very much where the belly rises and falls rather than upper, because that can help ground you. But when you're using something like the breath, you're playing catch up, right? You're not really with the breath as it's happening. You're with the breath that just happened and the breath that just happened and the breath that it just happened, watching that. And eventually, 
you're more in the conception of breathness. And that becomes your single pointed focus because a truly physical sensation is not an appropriate object to develop shine shamatha single pointed concentration, but it can get you there, right? So you're using your actual physical sensation of breath for a while until you're steady enough with it to let go of the physicality of it and kind of be more just with the presence of it. And it's a subtle point, but you know, experiment. The other piece is watching the breath is a very good preliminary to get surface distractions to settle down before you go into use of deeper objects. So we use the breath a lot as a preliminary, but in our tradition, it's not usually encouraged as an object of single pointedness. Although in other traditions, sometimes it is and it can work, but just know it goes to that deeper place with it. Yeah, any questions about that? I have a question, Venerable. Yeah, go ahead. So my experience with Vipassana has been through the um, Vipassana centers. Like the um, Wink, Wink, exactly. And so there we do the Anapana, which is focusing on breath for about three days. And then I believe it's on the, it's been a while since I've gone. It's been about five years. And then I believe it's on the fourth day, we switch over to the body scan. And that is what is called Vipassana in that context. And from what I remember, that is supposed to help us understand impermanence, right? Because things are constantly changing. And I was just curious if that, if there was a meditation similar to that in the Vajrayana tradition. Yes, uh, yes, that is a um, uh, common to all traditions practice, but we would use the four close placements of mindfulness. So the four close placements of mindfulness um, are on, you know, going, basically they're using different levels of subtlety to prove the four seals and understand the four noble truths. And it's a whole kind of beautiful interwoven practice to help with similar understandings of reality and the self and the body as Goenka kind of pared down version. But the goal is to get out of samsara and to achieve full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings in our tradition. So a lot of the techniques are similar, but the goal is very specifically Buddhahood. And that's very conscious from the very beginning. So um, there, but that technique, um, if you're looking for the more Buddhist version, because Goenka isn't really technically Buddhist, um, but he was using some things from Buddhism and some things from Hindu. Um, People may debate me on that, but anyway, I hold my ground. Um, I'm sure he had the best of intentions. I'm not sure. I hope he had the best of intentions. I hope he had the best of intentions. And those retreats can be really useful and really fascinating, um, but also without enough kind of context and holding, if you are prone to mental illness or have a predisposition to psychosis, it can actually trigger that. So um, I would say, unless you have very, very strong, robust mental health and good physical health, I wouldn't do them just as a side note, <laughs> um, but they also can okay. be really useful and beautiful. But if you're looking for our version, look for four, four close placements of mindfulness or the four foundations okay. of mindfulness. Yeah, and there's okay, a thank picture you. that goes with it and it's really cool. So yes, very okay. similar. Thank you. And, and those are kind of an instance of using single pointedness with an agenda to prove something. So it's not quite analysis, but like Andrea was saying, you're watching to see the impermanence of it as opposed to watching it, whatever it is, depending on the session, just for its own sake to develop concentration. You're watching it with an agenda to prove impermanence or an agenda to prove selflessness or an agenda to prove that you know, contaminated phenomena are in the nature of suffering. You know, you're watching it to prove something specific. So it's like single pointedness with an agenda specific to what you observe under the umbrella of, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So you use the motivation to launch yourself. You pick the one thing that you're watching, but you're watching in order to see something specific. So it's like almost analysis, but not quite. It's more single pointed. Um, yeah. So yes, those words, Vipassana and Shamatha, 
can mean different things in different contexts. And that's slightly aggravating. And that's part of why in the beginning, it's good to try and stay with one tradition long enough to understand the way they use vocabulary and the way contexts and concepts exist in Buddhism. And then you can go to other traditions and cross fertilize without getting confused. But if you're, if you're always pinging around to a million different traditions, you can start to misunderstand and um, conflate things that are actually different tools for different reasons and get yourself kind of into a bit of a mishmash and it's just not as efficient. So there's nothing wrong with the other traditions. They're wonderful, but even between Gelugpa, Nyingma, Kagyu, Sakya, sometimes we use terminology slightly differently. So it's easiest to just stick with one. Yeah. And then later when you're really clear on stuff, you can go to the other ones and not get confused. For example, it's fun to go to Nyingma centers and Kagyu centers to hear how they approach Tantra, for example, or how they discuss the mind because it can really augment what we do because we can get too technical and kind of um, stuck in our heads and literal and they're a little bit more experiential. So that can be a beautiful marriage, but only if you feel grounded in your own tradition first so you don't get confused. Side random advice. <laughs> Thank so. you. I've heard that before where people will say, you know, if you pick a tradition, even just amongst like the main, you know, Vajrayana or Theravada, like stick with it mm -hmm. so that you can really understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not like you can't jump ship later if there's something that feels like it's resonating with you more. It's just kind of like stick with it long enough to understand what it is. That you're taking on or discarding you know like some of you know i was in the zen tradition for maybe seven years before i became tibetan buddhist but i was with them long enough to understand their techniques and their goals and their tools and their general worldview and i have great respect for them and i think they do amazing work and it's not quite my style i am more productive with the tibetan tradition you know but I, you know it was seven years before i made that choice so you know slowly slowly <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have a little stretch and then we'll do meditation. So this meditation we're going to do, again, single pointedness on a familiarized object. And uh, side note, I just wanted to clarify before we start, when you hear the word mindfulness in Buddhism, it means not forgetting a virtuous object. And that is a broader category that can apply to your daily life mindfulness, trying to stay on track with your path, or it can be in the context of meditation, not forgetting the object that you brought to mind. So sometimes people say mindfulness meditation synonymously with single pointed meditation or shamatha, um, but mindfulness can be a broader category than that, including just staying aware of your path during your daily life, maintaining ethics, etc. So it's a mental factor. It's one of the object ascertaining mental factors for you scholars. <laughs> so when we do this meditation, I'm going to use the preliminaries to shamatha as just kind of grounding bullet points. And then we're going to bring to mind a virtuous object, Shakyamuni Buddha, or you can replace it with your fave. And just do little short spurts, a minute at a time, giving it your best work and then release, relax for a sec, and then try again. And just try and have as good a concentration as you can while keeping a relaxed mind. And just see if you can have even a few seconds of that kind of clarity that we can work and build on. So nice straight back and breathe into the space and just get yourself settled and grounded. And you can think to yourself, I need concentration for almost everything. But in particular, I need my concentration on the spiritual path. And I need it in order to be conjoined with all the other perfections, to make them stronger and deeper, to integrate them, to realize them. But in particular, I need to conjoin it with wisdom. 
special insight into reality. Because with these two combined, I can fundamentally cut the root of samsara and end suffering and go on to purify both afflictive and cognitive obscurations, becoming fully enlightened. So I need concentration. And so just think that right now in your space, you are safe. You're in a well-contained place. That there's all sorts of trouble in the world, but right now in your home, in your room, with yourself, you are safe. And that feeling of safety is essential for having concentration. And in order to concentrate, we need little desire. So our desires will come and go, but right now we just choose not to feed them. This is such a short session. I have all the time in the world to look after my basic needs. I don't need to feed my desire, I can be stable. I can be content. And I might have work that is very distracting, that requires a lot of attention. But right now in this moment, there is no need to think about it. In fact, thinking about it will be an obstacle. So decide to be focused. And we need to be morally pure in the sense of non-harmfulness. We need ethics in order to concentrate for many reasons. But one of them is that if we've done the wrong thing, all of the justification and excuses and hiding, all of that takes up so much mental energy and is so distracting. All the guilt and shame and angst around mistakes and all of this distracting and tantalizing things of those attachment objects, all of that clouds the mind. And so just decide for this short time to be in this quote, morally pure way of non-harmfulness, not feeding the beast. We can be ethical. And we can avoid the superstitions that make us attached to sense objects. The superstitions that say these sense objects are happiness. We know that they aren't from their own side. So we don't need that hunger, that anxiety, that craving right now. We can just be calm with what is. So just imagine that you have these preliminaries complete, whether you actually do or not. Just know to focus really, I need to be safe and stable, content and focused, ethical and calm. And from that place, I bring to my mind's eye a virtuous mental object like Shakyamuni Buddha. But whatever we choose, we think of it as bright, keeping our mind awake and happy, and we imagine it has a little bit of weight, 
keeping our mind from flying off into distraction. And so choose and bring it to your mind's eye and stabilize. Commit to staying with it for one solid minute. And let go of your focus for just a second. Blink, look at the light, refresh yourself. And then once again, nice and bright and clear, bring your mind to the focal object. Steady. and commit to staying with it as undistractedly as you can for one more full minute. And the image dissolves into light and absorbs into you. And we imagine that then we connect with loving kindness, compassion, conjoined with wisdom, which takes the form of Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum, 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 Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel Bodhicitta arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, 
but increase more and more. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So thank you everyone. And we have only one more session of this class and it will be all wisdom all the time. So if you have um, other questions about concentration, see the Lamrim Chenmo for details. And uh, now Christina, our SPC at Land of Medicine Buddha has just a couple brief announcements. Great, I did wanna mention that next week is the final class for this particular series. Um, Venerable Yinchen will be teaching again um, continuously in January. So we'll, we'll make those announcements next week as well. Um, and this Saturday, we have a, a meditation, a Saturday morning meditation uh, with Venerable Amy. And I'm gonna go ahead and share that link in the chat if you guys would like to join in this Saturday. Thank you again, Venerable Yinchen, you're absolutely such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, again. everyone. Thank See you, Christina. Happy one for Thank those you, who are in America. <laughs> yes. Night, folks. Thank Good you. Night. Good